Welcome back to the ACE Talks podcast, where we talk about Ecuador and a little more. Today, it's just me, but we've got quite the heavy topic to talk about, since we're not only going to understand what happened in Salinas, but we're also going to take a look at a side of Ecuadorian culture that you might not know about. And in order to get a full understanding of everything, this episode is going to have three main talking points. The first is an analysis and interpretation of everything that happened in Salinas and actually in most of Ecuador and the repercussions of what happened. And not only that, but also the message or post that not only represents what one Ecuadorian thinks about everything, Ecuadorian culture and the situation in Salinas, but it is also a representation of what most Ecuadorians think. Then we have the second point, which is my personal thoughts and experiences. Basically, what I've come to learn from having true coexistence with Ecuadorians, as well as the thoughts of actual Ecuadorians themselves about Ecuador and Ecuadorians. And then the final talking point is the things that you must take away from all of this. And remember, if you don't listen to the takeaways, then having listened to the first two points will be meaningless. And inversely, if you listen to the takeaways without listening to the first two points, then it's going to be pointless as well. So let's start by understanding the first point, which is the things that happened in Salinas as well as the poster message. And first, let's start off by understanding the carnaval culture, which is basically once it's carnaval and you're in Ecuador, it's almost impossible to avoid it. The only way that I could see you avoiding carnaval, at least the celebrations of getting foam thrown at you, maybe getting water thrown at you, the whole situation of people trying to throw you in pools, is to basically avoid any place that is either a beach, so if you live close to a beach, you know, stay away from the beach, or basically trying to either leave the country, because obviously if you're not in Ecuador, no one can do anything to you, or leaving the city that you're in, if it's a city where there's a lot of people, and even then, you still run the risk of someone possibly, I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but someone possibly doing something to you that's carnaval related. And this goes back to a comment that I actually read in the video that I made, the podcast episode that I made with Roberta, where there was someone who actually said that a month before carnaval, which I think is pretty crazy because things don't tend to happen a month before Carnaval, I can kind of understand and justify a week, maybe a few days. I mean, especially me, I thought that Carnaval pretty much started like on Thursday and not specifically on Sunday because I could already imagine people saying like, okay, so Thursday we're gonna head to the beach, on Friday we'll ask for the day off, and Saturday we enjoy Carnaval, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, so, that was the thought process that I went into, thinking about how people were gonna celebrate. And there were some people who did start celebrating at least as early as Friday, but a month in advance, way too early. And that was actually part of the comment that the person said that they were in the city, well, it was their mom, and that's what kind of frustrates me about it, and it was also them, but mainly their mom. They were going to a bus station, bus stop, and there they had, their mom had something thrown on them. I don't know if it was foam. I don't know if it was water. But the worst part like of having that happen is one, I mean, the lack of consent, I guess I'm not taking part in this. Like, why are you doing this to me? It's like, I can understand that thought process. But more than anything, if you see someone, uh, a lady, and she's carrying a cane, because that's what the comment said, that this person's mom had a cane why would you throw something at them? The, the lack of respect was just um, absurd. But yeah, that happened. And the comment also said that this person, not their mom, but the person themselves, was just going on, the, on their bike in the streets and they had water thrown on them or something. I don't know if it was water or foam, but it was like they're not even taking part of the celebration. It's a month in advance. Like, 
I would hate to have to give the advice that you have to start preparing for Carnaval like a month in advance because it's bad enough that you have to start getting ready a week but like to have to worry a month that people are gonna do things to you, it seems excessive. If you're worried of something like that happening to you, try to stay away, like I said, from places that you know are going to celebrate Carnaval in a way that you're not gonna like. Because if you like it, then you know, whatever. But now let's understand the things that happened during Carnaval, specifically in the areas of Salinas and Crucita, because those were the ones that were most heard about, even though it, there was talks that there were other parts of the country that also had certain bad things happen. But let's focus more on the main parts. With the first being what happened in the streets of Salina, basically what the story is, is that the cars that drove by there obviously were under heavy traffic because there were a lot of vehicles trying to get in and out of Salinas. So during that traffic jam, you had a lot of people who had to stop, obviously, because it's a traffic jam. You move maybe a few inches and then you have to stop. So what happened? It would be bad enough to say that you're stuck in traffic, but imagine being in the middle, like your car. This is the street, you have the street. You're the car in the street. And on either side of you, there's groups of people. You could imagine it like rows of people who are just like, watching you as you travel into and out of the city. I'm not sure if that's fun to some people, or I don't know if it's just because that was just an area that people decided to take to party, but I, I thought it really weird, really awkward for people to just stand there watching people drive by. But anyways, they weren't just standing and watching. This is where the first problem comes in. So the first thing that happened that was really bad is that people, when the, when the car stopped, the people were grabbing onto the cars and they were shaking them, like earthquake style shaking, like shake, shake. And it was pretty crazy for me to hear, not really because of the, the shaking of the cars. I guess you could say that like, it's not a big deal. Like if you're in a car, you're gonna feel safe, especially if you know it's not an actual earthquake, it's just people shaking it. What really hit me the most was the frustration I felt at knowing that someone touched someone else's car with that kind of intention or just touched it at all. What you have to understand about buying a car here in Ecuador is that for most people, it's inaccessible. That's why people travel mainly by bus, people travel mainly through taxis. They don't have their own form of transportation. So to have someone touch your vehicle, your car, which is expensive, and even if you were to buy it cheap, like there are cheap cars such as the Picanto, which cost like around twelve to $13,000. And there was a decent car that uh, my friend Don Shader, he recently bought at like around $19,000. But that's still a lot of money. For people here who earn minimum wages of $450, even if you were earning a wage of around five to $600, with everything that you have to spend during the month, where do you find money to save for a car? People tend to get loans, and do things in order to get these vehicles, but that doesn't make the car any less expensive. In fact, it makes it much more expensive to get a loan, to get a car. So I don't really see like the logic behind people touching someone else's car because you could scratch it. Uh, you could end up damaging something from shaking it like that. Who knows? That's the first bad thing that happened. And it, it just like, it made no sense to me. And then we go on to where the situation escalates because during that same process of people shaking down the cars that were passing by, they even shook down police cars. So it wasn't just restricted to, to or limited to civilians. It was actually also policemen. So it was like, I saw a truck in a video like getting shaken down, like, what are you doing? <laughs> then the, the next thing, which is worse obviously than this, is that in the process of some people just like shaking the cars, there were others who were trying to get into the cars. Like when the car stopped, there were people who would go up to the car and like try to open the handle. Like they would hold the handle and like try to open the car door. The thought process of many people here was that the reason why the people did that, there's two. One reason was to try to get into the car to do carnival stuff. They open the car door so they can like throw foam on you or they can throw water at you, which 
not big deals, still bad because like you're wetting the inside of, of someone's car. Once again, going back to the lack of respect of someone's private property, someone's hard earned property. Then there was the other thought process, which actually did happen too, where the reason why they were opening the doors was to steal things from inside the car. Cell phones, purses, anything that, you know, you can get your hands on and can be easily removed. And let's not use the argument of um, you should keep your doors locked if you don't want anything to happen. Why should someone have to go to the extreme of locking their doors and having to worry about locking their doors if no one should be trying to get into your car in the first place? Like the argument of someone like having to, to go to the extreme of locking their doors just to not get robbed is completely invalid. But anyways, that was the second thing that happened. And that one kind of ties into the third thing that is, uh, I think out of the things that I'm gonna talk about that happened in Selena's and Crucita, I think it's the worst thing, but we're gonna mention it now because it ties into the first two things. So what happened next in one of the videos was that there was a guy and the guy went to a kid. The kid seemed to be with them because they were all dressed very similarly from what I could tell in the video. And he gave the kid a gun. Like literally this man gave this child who was no older than like 10 or 12 years old, a weapon. And I don't know if he told the kid, hey, you know, go start uh, sticking up the people. But the kid went and they started tapping on the windows with the gun of cars that were driving by. And with the amount of people that were there, it was impossible for a car to just say, okay, I'm gonna like take off and like avoid this happening to me. Because a street, there's cars in front of you, cars behind you, and to your sides, there's a ton of people. Either you crash into the car in front of you, you, you crash into the car behind you, or you hit the people in Grand Theft Auto style who are on your sides. No matter what, you're gonna get in trouble for it, which is terrible because you should not have to panic to that level where you're worried about getting in trouble for trying to escape something that should not be happening to you. And no child should be given a gun. Like how someone could think that giving a child a weapon and once again, I don't know if this child was trained, it was, he was with the people, this, this 10 to 12 year old giving him a weapon to stick up vehicles that were, tr that were just passing by. Like I, I worry for the future of that child. I just hope that somehow all of this results in a positive lesson. Maybe they catch these people and they, they show the child the good things. But anyways, that was the worst thing. And don't worry, we do have other things to talk about later, which are positive things. Not from Carnaval itself. We're gonna talk about things from my personal experiences about Ecuador and Ecuadorians. So if this section really seems negative, it's just, I guess, a prelude into the more positive things to come. And like I said earlier, the takeaway at the end that you need to get from all of this. So going on into the next bad thing, we had a situation that I think is not common here in Ecuador, not common publicly because privately, I do see these things or not see them, but hear them happen. And you could consider it to be normal to the level where it's like, you'll hear people talk about it, but you won't hear people publicize it. Like you won't see it in news or in videos because it's just something that people keep to themselves. But what happened was there, was, there were sections in both Salinas and Crucita, which were the main places that this happened, where people were holding these kind of wet t-shirt contests. Now, I've never seen, never been to, never been a part of, never, experienced a wet t-shirt contest. I have a general idea of what they are. Basically, people, typically ladies, getting water thrown at them, and I guess dancing. At least that's what the video kind of portrays. I guess there's a lot of hype in these events because obviously there are guys, if there, if there are ladies dancing, there are the guys who are trying to like, hey, yeah, who, you know, um, cheering them on. This wouldn't be a problem in and of itself, I guess, because I guess the people who take part in these contests consciously know or are aware of what they're doing. Like, it's a wet t-shirt contest. They tell you it's a wet t-shirt contest. So if you participate in it, 
it's because you want to be a part of it. Where it got bad was where the videos pretty much show you. And that's the thing about all of these videos. They give you the, the idea of what happened during, but maybe there's no pre and there's no after. So basically in this video, you see that there's ladies. Actually, you could see I think two to three ladies dancing. And they're not dancing just like by themselves. They're dancing with a guy behind them. Okay. You would say that's, that's fine, but maybe I'm using the word dancing <laughs> in a wrong way because what was happening in the video was that there was a lady and the guy behind her was feeling her up. Now, if you think that's like normal in dancing, I guess we have different definitions of normal because to me, normal dancing is when, I don't know, you like maybe you stick close to the person, maybe you grab their hips, their shoulders, if you're intimate, maybe you grab the butt. But um, here, the person behind the ladies was feeling up on them. The guy was grabbing the lady's breast and going as far as masturbating these ladies, like touching down in private parts. And like, you would think that's bad enough as is because we're talking about a wet t-shirt contest. Oh, he's kind of going overboard. Then you see that the ladies, I mean, the whole time you see that the ladies are actually naked and they don't have the face of someone who's not enjoying this situation. I'm not sure if this is normal and I'm not going to normalize it because I don't think it is normal, but this is where it, it escalated to a level where people were surprised. Normally when these things happen, they happen in a way that, that it's more private. Like you'll see events like this happen in, in houses, in places where these things happen. I guess you could call them kind of like clubs, specific clubs for these things, but you don't really see them happening out in public. In one case, it was in Selena's, I think on a street, which will go into the more explicit one on that one in a bit, which you wouldn't expect there to be a more explicit one, but there actually is. And then you have the one that happened in Crucita, which was in front of a store, not even just on the street, but in front of a store. It's kind of crazy to imagine these things happening like so out in the open and so readily accepted by everyone. I mean, I guess you could say if the logic behind um, what you would call in Spanish morbo, which is basically in English like when you uh, look at things in a perverted way, you see that there's a lot of people like looking at this situation because it's, it's, it's public and someone even going to the level of recording it, which is probably why it went super viral here in Ecuador. Not sure about everywhere else, but here in Ecuador, it got way more attention than in previous years because that's actually something that I guess would be good to mention now. These things don't just happen in 2023 not just during Carnaval. There are things that happen not every day of the year, but you will hear things happening during the year that might surprise you, but you won't see them so publicly as we did with, with Carnaval, which is what made this whole situation much, much worse. That's the, the situation with, with the lady and, well, the ladies and what happened in Crucita. But going on with that situation, something much worse happened in Salinas that you would think there's something worse than, than ladies being masturbated while doing a wet t-shirt contest. There is. Apparently, in a street, I want to say that it was where there were parked cars and this was not where there were like the traffic jams. But there's a video, there's even a meme that was made of that video, which I'll talk about in a second. But there's a video where there's a guy and a lady and the lady is thrown on the hood of the car and they're just going at it. They're literally having sex on top of this car. And there's, there's people watching them and obviously someone recording them. And you're like, if you're watching this from the outside, like you're looking at this happen, like as people around there. And like, if you're looking at this through a video, like, are you like, <laughs> Like, I'm not saying for the person listening to this, this episode, but like for the people who are watching this uh, willingly happen, transpire, like, are you sick? I mean, I know it's very public, 
but you have the choice. Like, you don't have to watch this happen. But anyways, the meme that went with this is basically, it's like a joke that they say here. There's this like, they make this joke for like various situations where, where the girl tells the guy, I'm going to go out. The guy asks her, where are you going? She's like, oh, with my friends, you know, to a very tranquil plan. And the guy's like, okay. And then afterwards, the end of the post is like showing a picture. And it's like, quote unquote, the tranquil plan, the very calm, supposedly calm plan. And then something bad happening or something extreme with the, with the girl or the lady. In this case, it was basically just a picture of, of what had happened with this whole sex on top of a car situation. So it's pretty crazy. In terms of extreme, I still think that the worst thing that happened was the situation with giving a kid a gun. Like, who does that? In what mindset do you have to be to go and give a kid a weapon? And I didn't believe it when I heard it. I didn't believe the, the last three things that I mentioned, the naked ladies dancing, the uh, sex on the car, the kid getting a gun. Those were things that I didn't imagine to be real. Like someone told me and I was like, oh, it's probably a, it's probably a troll. Like, oh, it's probably just like, oh, it's a joke. But it was actually things that happened. Actually things that are recorded and there's evidence that they happened. So there's no turning a blind eye to this and saying, oh, it didn't happen. You're just exaggerating. It did happen. And it's crazy to believe that it happened because a lot of people here there's still an idea that this society is, is kind of behind on the times. Like people don't believe that certain things that are supposed to be taboo are actually happening. And even if they do believe it, they turn a blind eye to it in order to, to imagine that it's not true, that it's not happening. But it is. And um, there are repercussions for it, which is the next talking point. The first repercussion that we have with this whole situation is a more public and extreme one. And it's the fact that the governor of Salinas was removed. The president was not happy with what was seen, the image that was given of Salinas and Ecuador as a whole, because like I said, things happened in Salinas, things happened in Crucita, but some things also happened in Puerto Lopez, I think more related to the situation with crime and everywhere else you can imagine like Manta and stuff like that, probably less viral than the whole situation with the kid with the gun, ladies dancing naked, and the sex on the beach. Well, sex in the middle of, um, of traffic. It was still noticeable that it was just another carnaval where bad things happened, just some were made more public than the rest. So the president removed the governor of Salinas. I, I have a point of view on this which is basically that I don't think it's fair to blame the governor for the decisions that the citizens made. You can have a scenario where you give a person a choice, like you take them to, to a party and you tell them, okay, we have two drinks. We have normal red tropical flavored punch and we have punch that's been spiked. This punch has the worst possible things in it that will make you see stars if you, if you take it. You have the choice. So if you drink the red punch, you knowingly chose to drink something that was healthy. Not healthy in terms of sugar, like I have no idea what, how much sugar that punch has, but healthy in terms of it's not gonna mess with you, mess with your system. And then you have the choice to completely F yourself over drinking the, the spiked punch. And you, you got to choose. You wanted to, to F yourself up with it out of curiosity, out of a sense of pride, maybe, because you wanted to be cool. I don't personally think that makes you cool, but I guess some people could think that. So the people here relating it to the situation with, with Salinas, they had the choice. You could do the normal carnaval thing, drink with people, uh, dance, throw water and foam, or you could go for the spiked punch and give a kid a gun, naked dance, sex on the street. It's so sad that one person is taking the blame for what various people chose to do. But 
that's just the way it is. There were apparently some precautions that were given to the, the government of Salinas to close off the streets and basically only allow access to, you know, the beach. Maybe if the streets were open only for people to walk on and not so much to drive through. But that's just what happened. It was one of the most well-known repercussions because it was the one that like the president did it. But um, anyways, the other repercussion is more of a kind of quiet one. And it's, it's something that took a toll on the mentality of, of Ecuadorians. Basically, if people thought before that nothing bad happened, like adults sending their kids to, to the beach, taking their families to a place that's supposed to just be wholesome fun, wholesome, yeah, because you're just getting water and foam thrown at you and you're, you're enjoying the beach. And some people go out to drink, okay. It kind of skews all of that and makes you worry where you're sending your kids or where you're taking them and the dangers that could happen. Because even though it didn't happen, just imagine in the opening of the car doors, which was severe, but not the most severe thing that happened. Imagine someone kidnapping a child. Imagine someone sticking up the car, which necessarily didn't need to happen because I did hear, but since I didn't see it, I didn't mention it, but I did hear that someone stole a car. Just imagine the, the level of worry that most Ecuadorian parents already worry a lot. That's why they don't like let their kids go out alone or they, they always tell them, we'll drop you off and we'll pick you up. Imagine the, the next level of worry that has just been caused with this kind of situation. Will my son be the one making a spectacle out on the street, doing things, inappropriate things in the middle of the street? Or will my daughter be the one who's who's getting uh, abused because that's something I, I was gonna talk about, which I'll talk about now. We see the video from where it started to where it ended, but we don't see what happened before it. Maybe they, these ladies were given a lot of alcohol, a lot of drugs, which once again, you have every choice to make, whether you want the spiked punch or if you just want like the normal tropical punch. So people made the decision to over drink or to do drugs and they also made the conscious decision to just drink super calm with their friends or not drink at all. So we don't know what happened, but maybe they had an overdose. Maybe someone gave them something and said it was something else. So many things. But it was still something that, that happened. Like you can't ignore the fact that it happened. And you can't imagine the thoughts of already worried parents and adults and how much worse it's gonna be now going towards the future. You could obviously have people who don't really care and they saw this happen and they liked it. And that, that's just normal in every society. There are people who like certain things and people who don't. But at least for what is known in Ecuador, it just completely has changed the mentality of some people. And I'm sure that now there's gonna be more strict control when it comes to these kinds of public events, from my point of view and my opinion. Those are the main repercussions. Like I said, the governor being removed and the shift in mentality for Ecuadorians. But now let's go into the message, which kind of ties in a bit into the mentality and the culture, mainly the culture of, of Ecuadorians in general. Like you might not really understand Ecuadorian culture if you've just been here for a while, if you've only had quick interactions with people, if you've only had the chance to interact for a few days, a week. Sometimes you don't even have enough time to really understand the culture, even if you've interacted for a month. Which is why this post, this comment, this message that was made by this person, which I'm gonna pull up right now so that uh, we can analyze it, it was very heavy and a harsh reality that most Ecuadorians, I feel, would have a hard time accepting, not because they think it's fake or false, but because no one wants to change the way that they are. Just think about the culture of the place that, of where you're from. No matter where you're watching this video from, think about the culture, the identity 
that people have around you. If that identity or that culture, suppose, if you're known as people to be very, very calm, like if you're the, the people who you know around you and the culture that you have is a culture where everyone's respectful, uh, everyone's kind, people help each other, um, there's always fairness in everything that's done, there's justice. Could you imagine if someone told you to change your culture? No, you need to be less kind. You need to be disrespectful. You need to, to be less fair because that's the world. The world isn't fair. You need to be, you need to change your culture. How would you take it? You wouldn't want to change because you've grown up with this culture. This is the culture of everyone around you. So why would you want it to be different? So it's understandable here that when people see or hear this message, they're not going to like it. They, a lot of people actually didn't like it. And a lot of people, even in things that I've talked about before here about Ecuador, people don't like it. They say that, this, that these things happen everywhere in the world. They say that the situation here isn't as bad as other places. They say that, no, people aren't like that. There's no reason for me to make up the things that have happened to people here. There's no reason for me to talk about things that are negative in a way to just express it as negative. I always express it to make sure everyone understands that these things can happen here. Not because they're prevalent here or because they constantly happen here or because they're worse than anywhere else in the world. They need to be explained so that everyone understands that these things can happen anywhere. Reminds me of the phrase that Don Shader said, crime happens everywhere. It's just a thing that you have to learn to, to accept and understand. You can't undermine or undervalue a situation just because it's worse in a place that, that you know or that you've been to or that you come from. That wouldn't make it fair for the people who here have lived through these situations, who have experienced these things. But anyways, going into the message so that we can analyze it, and like I said, there's, there's going to be people who don't like it. There's going to be people who don't agree with it because it's just a thing that people don't want to accept. But based on everything that I know and have come to know during the whole time I've been here, and we're talking about 10 years plus, like if you don't believe it, it's just because you want to not believe it. You don't want to believe it. So anyways, the message, we're going to analyze it in parts. What happened in Salinas last night is a living reflection of the average Ecuadorian. And just to interpret the average Ecuadorian, think of a whole population as 100%. If 100% of the population is the total, an average would be probably around half to a little over half. Especially if you're talking about grades, you would be talking about 70%. But like I said, let's look at it at around 50 to 70 percent. So the average Ecuadorian is about 70, 50 to 70 percent of the population. Okay, continuing with the message. The disgust or repugnance, the lack of awareness, the disrespect, the abuse, the violence, the viveza criolla. This is a Spanish term, expression, and it's used to refer to people who, or an attribute that people have that basically they think they can get one over on everyone. They think they're slick. They think they can do things and people are just going to forgive them. They think that um, they can get away with everything. Continuing with the message, the tackiness, the ordinariness, the vulgarity, the noise, and the uproar. So all of these were attributes that this person is giving to Ecuadorians, to the average Ecuadorian. So they're basically saying they're a culmination of all of these things and that what happened in Salinas and basically most of Ecuador was a reflection of what a general Ecuadorian to this person, and like I said before, to many others, what a general Ecuadorian is. Let's continue with the message. The average Ecuadorian cannot have fun without attacking, without disrupting the peace of others, 
without violating the private property and integrity of others. The Ecuadorian race doesn't have the capacity to enjoy themselves without getting drunk until they're wasted. And just a quick pause, but the translation isn't wasted. The way that they mentioned it, it was like getting effed up. But I'm just saying wasted to use a more lax definition. Continuing with the message. Without making noise with mega speakers and loud music for the whole block to hear. Without considering that there are sick people because what matters to them is feeling cool and they want to be forgiven because they are quote unquote poor so they can screw or mess with others. Now, this section basically is outlining the fact that to this person, the average Ecuadorian doesn't know how to have fun. And their definition of having fun is basically getting drunk until they're, they're wasted, violating the rights of others and private property. Basically, a lot of people when they have these events, parties, situations, holidays, they, they don't care where they do it, like where they have fun. Like even though you know as a conscious human being that you should not make noise at around two in the morning, four in the morning, if you're in a, in a zone where there are houses around you, people will still throw parties, blast super loud music, uh, drink until they're wasted in that area. And they won't care if you have work tomorrow, if you're sick. So that's what this person is trying to say. People don't care here what your situation is as long as they can keep having fun. And then there's the fact that like at the end it says their justification for having this kind of fun is basically we don't have money so let us have our fun. Like don't take away our fun from us since we can't normally have it. And we'll go more into that because in the next part of the message it kind of explains it a little bit more. But just understand that a justification for having fun should not be because I normally can't have it or because I'm poor. That's my thought. But anyways, continuing the message. The average Ecuadorian can't see that a holiday is coming and decide they want to spend what they do not have even if they can't even go to the quote unquote Playita del Guasmo. And um, just a pause from the message. This is a beach that is uh, in Guayaquil, if I remember correctly, Guayaquil. And it's apparently a very cheap beach because it's close. I don't even know if you can call it a beach, but it's just an area. And the reference that they're making to it here is that people supposedly don't even have money for that. And when it's a holiday, they want to like spend money they don't have and go to places like not, not this beach, which is supposedly cheap, but go to like more expensive places. And where do they get the money from? Like spend money that they supposedly always say that they don't have. And um, this is a part of Ecuadorian mentality where I, I, it might even be mentality, worldwide mentality, where people say they don't have money. And then when it comes to these holidays or parties, then all of a sudden they do have money, even if they don't have money for, for medicine, for food. When it comes to a party, that's where they all of a sudden pull money out of like nowhere. And that's expressed in this message. Uh, continuing the message because whether it is from under the rocks or by pawning their teeth, they will get money to buy all the beer crates they can to go to the corner of the neighborhood, settle in and drink like there's no tomorrow with the most vulgar people they can. This part of the message basically, like I said, is is understanding that people will say they don't have money. Literally, they'll be like, I can't eat, I can't go out, I'm, I'm poor. And then they'll somehow find money to do the worst possible things. It's not like they have the money and they'll say, oh, we're going to go have fun in a decent way. But they find the money to buy beer crates, to go on a street, blast super loud music, and and just like, like have their fun that 
you could think of it as clean fun if it's just, oh, you know, they're drinking, minding their own business, but I mean, they're blasting loud music. They're saying they don't have money for anything else. It, ki it kind of goes against what they're saying. They say they don't have money, and then somehow they find it. Which, once again, we can justify it as people will find money to do things that they want to do. That's normal in every society. We, we all do that, I think. Like, obviously, if you don't want to spend money on something you don't want to do, you're going to say you don't have it. But if you want to spend money on something you do want to do, that's where you pull it out, even if you supposedly didn't have it. So, you know, I'll understand that. But basically, here they're mentioning that people who don't even have money to like, to like feed themselves, they're coming out and like, now they have money to do these things, these negative things and not positive things. But anyways, that's the interpretation of the message. And then we continue because there's still the last part of the message. The average Ecuadorian does not understand what respect is or what the basic rules of coexistence are. Because for them, the rest of us are sufferers, quote unquote sufferers. And just to make you understand, sufferers is the translation for the word sufridor, which is just like another way of saying hater. They use it a lot here to, to call people who are trying to call you out for doing something bad. Like they like to call you a hater for that or a sufferer for that. So just to give you an example, a lot of people here, I mean, well, not a lot. Let's just say people here. They will steal electricity or they will find a way to avoid paying the actual price of their electricity bills. They modify this thing called the medidor, which basically just measures how much electricity your house is using. So they'll find a way to modify it so that way it always reads that they're spending very low quantities of electricity and thus they pay very low for their electricity bill. And some people will call them out for that. And it's not a bad thing to call people out for that because it's something negative. But for being called out for it, the person who is calling out these people, will, the people will call this person a sufridor, a hater. Like I could understand hating someone for their success, like not understand it, but understand why someone would call you a hater for that. But if you call someone a hater because you're doing something wrong, like what is wrong with you? Like why are you like even putting yourself in that position? you know you're doing something wrong. Accept it and be better. So anyways, that's the situation with, with here. But let's continue and then I'll break down the message. Who do not know how to have fun just because there are those of us who seek the right spaces to have a good time without bothering or messing with anyone. End of message. Okay, so let's analyze this last part. So once again, going into the explanation of sufridor, sufferer, the hater. Basically here, it's saying that the average Ecuadorian doesn't understand respecting other people's personal space. Their, their way of having fun is not correct. That they have to do these things that were mentioned throughout this whole message that basically they shouldn't have to do in order to have fun. Because like the person in this message, message says, they, they call you a sufferer because you call them out on doing something wrong when the only thing you want is to have fun. Like you as the, per the person who's making the message, the only thing you want is to have fun in a correct way. And people don't understand that here. That's a big part of um, this whole conversation in general which is basically understanding that that's the way people tend to express their fun. And it's not an isolated incident where it's just Salinas. Everywhere you go, like Carnaval in general, is just a massive party where people are having fun in a way that's not exactly appropriate. Because you shouldn't have to block streets, you shouldn't have to make noise that you can hear various miles away. You shouldn't have to, to like get wasted drunk in order to have fun. And I realized that 
these forms of fun might be forms of fun that are had in different parts of the world. But that doesn't exactly make it correct. It doesn't exactly make it the ideal way to have fun. And that's what this person in the message was saying. They're basically just trying to make it clear that these things happen, they keep happening, and they need to stop happening. Because they're making it clear to everyone by expressing it that you need to accept this as a bad reality instead of justifying it with the typical justifications of that's just the way we have fun. Oh, we don't have money. Oh, uh, it's just once a year. Because it isn't just once a year. It's actually every time there's a big party, they do similar things. Maybe not to the level of Carnaval, but similar things. They throw similar parties that really don't need to happen. Of course, that's my perspective and the perspective of this person who made the message and other people who feel in a similar way. But is, is all of this really how all Ecuadorians are? Well, let's use this as an opportunity to transition onto the next point, which is now going into my personal thoughts, like what I think and the experiences that I've had. So first, in order to explain all of this, let me define what is true coexistence to me. Because there's such a thing as coexistence that I think goes through levels. Like you can have coexistence with people because everyone lives in the same place and maybe you interact to the point where you say hi to everyone. You are coexisting with them. But that to me isn't true coexistence. Because true coexistence to me comes when you've spent enough time with a person that you understand them on a deeper level. Like it's not just understanding that, oh, uh, I said hi to this person, good morning, they're a nice person. Oh, I went next door and asked for some sugar and they lent me some. They're a nice person. Or, oh, this person one day didn't help me, they're a bad person. Like coexistence isn't just these momentary actions. It's a culmination of these momentary actions and constant interaction with these people. Meaning you have conversations with them constantly, not necessarily every day, but constantly to the point where you might have a conversation once every other night. And you've been having these conversations with these people maybe for the process of a year or in my case, for 10 years plus. You've spent time with their families, you've spent time with them, maybe you even slept over. I've had that case, I've slept over friends' houses, and you've met their family and gotten to know them inside their households, not just out on the street where you would assume everyone has to maintain a pretty decent image. That to me, when you reach that level, is when you have true coexistence. And that true coexistence is something I've gained throughout the various experiences I've had here in Ecuador with Ecuadorians. So let's go back to the past a little bit. Starting off with when I got here and I got to school. In school, things were as you would expect. You're the new kid. And I'm not sure if this is the same in every place where you go to and you're from a different culture. But a lot of people they wanted to get to know me. They uh, wanted to know what things were like where I was from. And a lot of people became my friends or acquaintances just based on, on that. Like, they wanted to know where I was from. But some people, even one that's still my best friend to this day, my best friend Nacho, he's like, or they were like, always like there. Like, they, they were really nice. They invited me out to eat. They were always like making sure I was good. Like I understood the situation. There were some moments where because of the language barrier and my poor Spanish, they would laugh and everything because I couldn't pronounce words correctly. Sometimes some of them still do. But it's, it was never to the point where I felt like really bad. At the beginning kind of because they did make fun of my Spanish a lot and uh, they did bother me and like I couldn't take the jokes here very well. That might just be a me thing. But 
once I understood that that was the way that they were and that was the way things were here, like honestly, it wasn't bad. But then we go on into the situation, like moving on in life, going to college. And college for the most part was good. But even here, a lot of people warned me before going into college that the friends that you make in high school aren't the same friends you're gonna make in college. Like there's always gonna be a different level because in high school, you guys got to know each other even more. In college, these people, the people around you, they've already kind of formed the way they are based on the conversations and interactions that they've had during the years that they grew up in elementary and high school. So I did go in with a, with like, with a cautious mindset to college, but it was never terrible. There were some bad moments, some people who I did feel weren't truly my friends. And even now, like out of the people who I met in college, I don't keep in touch with a lot of them. Like I might still have not daily contact, but semi contact, like maybe once a month or once a year with like two, three, four people, maybe one person became my best friend, like not best friend, but became a good friend. But other than that, like, I really don't have a lot of interaction with the people from college, from what I can remember in this moment. But once again, never bad. And once again, I studied college here in, in Ecuador. So the people who were there were Ecuadorian and they weren't bad. And then we go on into workplace, into my working life. So here's some things that maybe you don't know about. I am a teacher, but I currently only teach in an academy. The academy is called Princeton. And in this academy, we teach English. And so far, out of all the jobs that I've had during the time that I've been here in Ecuador, it's been my favorite, my, my best experience. But the owner is someone who actually lived in the United States. So he understands how to treat and how to pay his workers well. I don't wanna justify that for how maybe the good or bad behavior of other places, but from my experience, that's the way it's been and comparing it with other places here in the city that I live in, honestly, it's, it's so much different. But anyways, going into my other work experiences, like I guess starting from the best, which was the academy going down to little by little what has been the worst, the second best place was the high school that I worked at before uh, I quit like about two years ago. And that is uh, uh, an actual high school, a private one, which isn't private like you would consider in other places. Like it's not super expensive or super exclusive. It's just the difference between public and private here is that public schools, obviously everyone is allowed to go to, everyone goes to, you don't have to pay. And private, you pay and it's a little bit more like as a parent, you could probably be more demanding in this kind of place because you're paying for it. And like, it's not that they can be more demanding, but they generally are. But anyways, uh, in this high school, the treatment was good. The payment, not the best. It's actually more terrible than most places, but um, I kind of justified it with the treatment. But after, like I said, since I quit two years ago, like I came to the realization when I quit, like before that, that the way that you have to work as a teacher the effort that you have to put in is not worth the compensation that I'm getting for it. Like some people might be very dedicated to their job just because they're hardcore teachers. And I don't consider myself to be anything less than a good teacher. But even then, I didn't feel comfortable staying there with the compensation I was getting. So anyways, but that place wasn't as bad as the next place that I, uh, that I worked at. But it was the first experience I had working. It was like, obviously, the beginning of my teaching career. So I worked as an elementary school teacher while I was in like, while I was in the university. And I worked at a place, not gonna mention the name because even though I dislike it and dislike what the owner did, I don't want anyone, you know, purposely looking for, for beef with people who, you know, at this point, doesn't matter. At this place, the majority of the workers who were there, we were all kind of newbies. Like we had just recently, like, like some of us were still in college and some of us were at the point where we were about to graduate from college 
and there were a few who had already graduated but only had like a year or two out of college so they didn't have a lot of working experience so they didn't have a place to like you know they typically ask you for let's just say 10 years of experience and you're just out of college like where do you get 10 years of experience in this place the the treatment as like i guess you could say between co-workers and even the staff it wasn't bad like it wasn't a situation where any of us were feeling like oh we're not being treated well we just in compensation terms we weren't being treated the best because when it came time for each month for us to get paid, we would always get paid late. Like, I'm not just talking about like, oh, okay, you're not getting paid like this week. You're probably going to get paid next week. No, it was always about a month. And sometimes for some people, it even went up to like three months without getting paid. And if you're like, listening to this and remembering what I said earlier about how much people make and if you know how much it costs to live in Ecuador, like even if you only had to pay six to eight hundred dollars a month to live per month here in Ecuador, like if you're not getting paid for three months, how are you living those three months? Like it's insanity to me because like there were some people who they, they did get paid a little bit earlier than the rest of us because they had a situation where they were like single parents or they found a way to like kind of pressure it. But the rest of us who were like more like kids, like we were treated like, like, no, you guys can wait pretty much. Like they didn't say that. They said we don't have money right now because the parents aren't paying, which is a real situation here. But that's a whole different topic that we're not going to get into. It, I, I will get into the fact that it's irresponsibility, but that's about it. The rest of us were just treated like we could wait and we didn't need the money immediately. But like, then why are we working? What are we working for? We're not working for free or to get paid when you feel like paying us. We need the money now. That's something that uh, happened there. And the situation escalated so much that, the one, that we were just tired of it. And we actually filed a lawsuit against that school. And we won because, yeah, we're not getting paid. Of course we won. It was just a terrible situation that I leave in the past because it just, it just showed me what I don't deserve as someone working at a place. To get paid late and I wasn't making a lot there either. So, you know, but that's just, once again, minimum wage in Ecuador and not, you know, teachers not being very conscious, not teachers, employers not being very conscious of what people should earn for the job they're doing. This goes on to another teaching experience. This one was more short-lived because it was just while I was trying to get a job and it was before I got the job at the, at the elementary school. It shows you a bit of how, of the, of the situation with Vivesa Criolla that I mentioned earlier, people thinking they're slick and they can get one over on you because I entered to work like I, I tried to pretty much compete because it was me and another person who I also think has a really good level of English. We entered to get a job at the high school and we went through a trial period, basically a month where we would give classes and, and show what we could do as teachers. And that wasn't the best time for me to be a teacher because I, wasn't, I was still at the beginning phase of being a teacher. But that doesn't mean I didn't do my job. It just means I consciously know that I wasn't the best teacher at that time. While I was working there, I was promised, and remember, this was the, the most expensive high school, and it probably still is at the time. So if you're from where I'm from, like where I'm living right now, you probably know where I'm talking about. But once again, I won't mention their name just because it already passed. I keep that to myself because this school has actually asked me to work for them later on, but I'm not interested because I already know what they did and I have not received an apology for it. But let me explain to you what happened because you're probably like, what are you talking about, Ace? So what happened was that I went into this trial period. I gave my classes. I tried to do the best I could with the little to no experience that I had. My main experience was knowing English and being a very prepared person because I'm very meticulous with the things that I do. I like to pre-plan and prepare everything I can. Before I started, me and my friend, we were promised that if um, 
We did this, we were gonna get compensated for the days that we worked. And each day we were promised around $20. It was actually $20 specifically. I just wanna say around because I don't know if my friend was promised more or if my friend was promised less. But anyways, we were promised $20 each day that we were working. So, okay, cool. If that seems little to you, then remember, Ecuadorian salary is not the best. So I went through this trial period. I suffered a lot because, like I said, I wasn't the best teacher at the time, didn't know how to manage a classroom very well, and at that time, the school wasn't as organized as it is now. And I still think it's lacking in some terms of organization, but that just might be an Ecuador thing in general. What happened was at the end, when I went to go get my payment, I asked for it. I'm like, oh, hey, okay, so we're done. Uh, so yeah, uh, can I get my, my payment? Okay, yeah. Boom, they paid me. I checked how much I got paid just because, you know, I wanted to count it and be like, you know, be happy about it because like when you get some money and like since I hadn't worked for a while since I was trying to find a job like I was really happy to get that money and since I had already calculated the amount I was like yes I'll be able to use this for X or Y thing so when I got the amount it was much less than what they had originally promised like they promised $20 and I got paid like $12.50 per day and I was clearly like, okay, whoa, they gave me less than I expected. Maybe they, they forgot the amount. Maybe they, 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 didn't, they didn't like, you know, give me the right amount or um, who knows. So I told her, hey, uh, the, the secretary at that time or accountant, not sure who it was. Hey, uh, this, this isn't the amount we agreed on. Like, this isn't what you promised. And the person, like, like, like it was nothing. Like that person said, oh, you didn't get that in writing. So that's what you get. I was like, no way. What? Oh my goodness. Like it, it was so shocking to me that I almost like, like I couldn't believe it. I, I left that place like in rage. I didn't get mad there because I have a, a social standard of not like, not taking my anger out on people. I should have told her like, wow, you guys are liars. Like what, what is wrong with you? But um, I, I just, I can't, I can't. I prefer to just go to my room and just like get mad about it and like maybe talk to my friends and tell them the situation. I told my parents and they're like, wow, that's, that makes no sense. And even my dad wanted to go talk to them, but I told them, you know what, just let it go. That's the way they wanna be. If they ever need me in the future, I'm not gonna work for them. And I've kept that promise to this day because when they offered me a job, I told them the only way you're gonna get me is if you give me what I need to stop doing everything I'm doing right now. Like to make my plans and my goals get ahead. You have to give me this much. If not, I'm not working. They didn't accept, so too bad. Either way, if I would have worked there, I would have sat down with the principal and said, uh, hey, you know, a few years ago, this happened. I'd like an apology. But you know, it didn't happen. I'm not working there and I'm not planning to work there. I much prefer to make these episodes, videos, uh, work as a teacher at the academy because it's been going well for me in all of these things. So why would I torture myself working at a school that uh, already ripped me off once? Continuing with, uh, with the last thing in, in work environments that I had was something that's a little more recent, about a year or two ago when uh, I went viral as Spider-Man. And basically there's this recording company that made these videos and that, ma that makes videos in general. And they made this video of me as Spider-Man. They asked me to be a part of this video because yes, the video was pre-planned. But basically the premise of the video was me dressed as Spider-Man. I went to meet up with a girl, ask her out, and she rejected me because it was ridiculous that I asked her out dressed as Spider-Man and that I was making a, a show out of it, like a spectacle in front of a lot of people. And um, she walked away, I was rejected, and that went viral. I even saw it in TikToks from United States and other places, so I'm sure that you, you might have seen it or heard of it. But anyways, I went and uh, I did that job. At the beginning, they had told me that it was just gonna be a job. We wanted you to act like this. 
uh, we don't know if it's going to go viral. We don't think it's going to go viral. We're not sure really. Like, it was just a bunch of like, like when people try to sweet talk you so that you don't get what you deserve. And honestly, since I've never worked in that, I didn't know what was the, the rate. So they offered me like $15 for, for doing this acting job to just like act out a scene. And like, like you might see that as a little, you might see that as a lot for something that was just, you know, quick acting. But it was embarrassing seeing it after because in the process, I kind of just like, like I'm, I can be spontaneous and stuff like that. So it wasn't a big deal to me. When, when I acted it out and when I accepted their payment, it was under the premise that this was just going to be like another video that they needed to be made. They wanted to take advantage of the, of the season because at that time, the, the Spider-Man movie with uh, the three Spider-Men had recently come out. So they wanted to take advantage of that hype. So I didn't think much of it, but like I even asked like, oh, do you think it's going to go viral? They're like, no, we don't know. We're like, it's probably not because like we like, you know, it's hard to go viral. And they sold me on that idea. And that's why they offered me that little. But the video went viral over 15 million views, which not even on my YouTube channel do I have 15 million views. Like I don't have uh, 15 million views combined with all the platforms where my content is distributed on. They got that many views and that's where I felt kind of like, like, you know, hey, maybe I'll ask to see if like they can give me a little bit more. Like I wasn't even expecting them to like give me like, like 50%, even though I was 50% of the act. And even if you were to say like, oh, but like you didn't have to edit the video, you didn't have to record it, you didn't have to do all these things. I was the one who acted out that video and made it be so popular because they couldn't find anyone else with a Spider-Man costume, a good one. All I was going to ask for was like a small percentage, like 5% of whatever they earned. Maybe like, which I, I, in my mind, I told them, hey, like, even if I get like $100, like, that's fine. Because that was going to help me out a lot, especially considering that I'm not making a lot in my current job. When I asked them for that, they like kind of went into this like, conversation period like oh we'll see da, da, da. and then afterwards they said no we can't do that and after like this time that i've been making content and stuff like that like i've come to realize 15 million views on a video is really good money good enough to say that hey ace we can give you a hundred dollars sorry we only gave you 15 or 20 here's a hundred thanks for helping us get this viral video we want to keep working with you but now i don't trust them but yeah that's why I've had good and bad working experiences here in Ecuador. But, and once again, this last one kind of goes to the whole Vivesa Criolla, where they think they can get one over on me. But I'm not going to forget. I'm not going to work for them. I don't like what they did. So, yeah, that's the situation that happened. But that doesn't mean that my other workplaces were bad. They were actually really good. Like I said, well, the ones at the beginning, the, the academy, the high school, the, the bad ones were just uh, the situation with the elementary school and the other school that I subbed at that I had that one month trial period and this acting gig that I told you about. So yeah, that's the workplace situation. And then we can go into friendships. I've had like the best friends here in Ecuador. I love my friends from the States. We always talk about getting together. But here in Ecuador, since I've had so much time to spend with my, with my friends here, the ones who I consider my friends, because there are some who I consider my friends, some who I consider my bros, and some who are just acquaintances, because I only see them like once in a blue moon, and like maybe I'll only say hi to them on the street because they'll only say hi to me on the street, and we won't see each other much more than that. But my friends here have been amazing. Like here with my friends, I felt like, like they've been really good to me to the point where some of them have like invited me to go to like parties, at least when I got here at first. Cause now it's a lot less because uh, they don't go to parties that much themselves. It's just no time because of work. But with my bro, like my best friend Nacho, like it's always been super cool, the treatment with him because whenever we go out to do something, like let's just suppose we go out today to eat in Cebollado. And you guys know, or you might not know, but I'll let you know that I love in Cebollado. It's an Ecuadorian dish uh, that's like a soup, pretty much. But not really. But it's like fish soup. And my friend, like since I've been here, he's most of the time just invited me. And like he's never asked me like, oh, hey, pay me back. 
he's always just done it because he's always just been like, hey, let's go eat something. Like, let's go eat it in Cebollado. And like, I've always felt that, and I'm gonna make a small comparison here, that here, you don't feel the pressure of people like when they invite you out, like you have to pay them back later. Like, especially your friends like, like this. And maybe it's just coincidence because maybe I didn't have enough interactions in the States with friends like in this level where they would just invite me out to something. But over here, it's like, it's been like that a lot. Like if I didn't have the way to pay for something, at least with my bro, with Nacho, he's always been like, hey, you know, I'll pay for you. Not a big deal. And I also do the same thing vice versa because of course I would. He's always been really good to me, so why wouldn't I be really good to him? So it's just, it feels like you don't have that I owe you mentality, which I always felt that I had more in the States. And I don't know if maybe it's just me imagining that I had to have that mentality, but it's just something that I managed to notice. But then we go into the more negative situations that I've had, and there's been times where I've lent money, like out of the innocence of my heart, like believing that, that I was lending it and it wasn't gonna be a bad thing, but there was a time I lent a friend, I lent him $20. He was like, I need the money, please, can you lend it to me? I was like, okay, sure, cool. I lent it to him. He disappeared for like years. I didn't see him for years. And the only reason he paid me back was because one time I ran into him in, in the mall with my parents and I, I confronted him with my parents which I know I should confront my own problems myself, but you know, my parents uh, helped me out on this. And we told him to, to pay me back, and he did. Apparently, he had forgotten, he didn't have the money, but it was terrible. And that wasn't the only time that I lent money and I didn't get paid back for years. I actually believed a sob story from, from, a, from what used to be a friend when I was training baseball in the Federation because I did play baseball in the Federation too. And she told me, no, I need this money for rent because of my studies, please. I need $100, like I desperately need it. Like I asked friends who are friends of hers as well, like, hey, do you think I can lend it, her this money? They're like, it's your choice. And I did because, you know, I believed the sob story. Years passed by, like more years than with this other guy. And she never, paid me back the complete amount. One time I ran into her and like, I got her to give me back like $20. And she said, no, don't worry, I'll pay you back next month. Never heard from her again. I actually have not seen her in forever. And I hope I don't because it'll just make me mad that I was so gullible to, to lend out this money and not get it back. So those are the situations with friendships, acquaintances like that I've had like you saw, my best friend, really positive situation, and these two other people who didn't know to pay me back, really negative parts of Ecuadorian mentality or culture. And then when it comes to relationships, I mean, with the girlfriends that I've had here in Ecuador, it's like, it's never been bad, like terrible bad to a level that's like unheard of in other countries. Like, I had a really good relationship with my last two girlfriends, the last one that I had was probably the best relationship I've had in my life, but I've also had negative relationships. I've been cheated on, I've been dumped in five days. It's just things that happen. But I think that's something that in terms of relationships happen everywhere. What I can say is kind of weird about like relationships here, I guess, like starting a relationship or what I've also heard. They think, I guess, uh, in, in terms of Latin girls, they think they're crazy. I can't confirm and I can't unconfirm. Basically, there's also this like idea that girls get together with guys here for their money. Even a friend of mine from the States said that you do see that a little bit more here in Latin America than you do in the States because there's more independence in the States. I don't look at it like, like girls looking for guys with money. I look at it more like girls looking for guys with stability. Like if you, as a girl, see a guy with a car, it's not like, oh, the guy has a car. I see that more as like the girl seeing the guy as someone who's stable, who has a job and who can afford to have a car. I could be wrong. It could be the complete opposite that they, yeah, they like the car and they like to travel. Some girls do like that, but like, I don't think that's the only reason, like just because they wanna have a guy with a car or a guy with money. They want a guy who can bring them stability, who can bring them peace, 
to their world. So I want to believe that's the case, but like I said, I can only talk for my situations, what I've seen, what I've heard, and at least from what I've seen and what I feel at least a little bit in this situation is it's not gold digging, it's just looking for stability. And then let's take a look at crime, which personally, I will say that I've only run into crime two times, which is one too many, but I've only personally been involved in crime two times, like had it happen to me. And the reason for that mainly is because I've known how to listen to my own advice. After the first time I got robbed, I was done with it. I did not want to have that happen again. So I've always taken the necessary precautions to avoid getting robbed. Like it's hard to avoid crime in its totality because in any moment of the day, you can run into a situation where something bad could happen. That's why in my tips, I always say, you know, avoid going out at night, like avoid going out by yourself, avoid carrying around expensive things because there are things that will make it more likely for crime to happen. But for some friends, like I hear this a lot, like friends always tell me like, this person got robbed, I got robbed. Like I have a friend who's been robbed in less than six months, three times. Like literally I saw him again recently and again, he got his cell phone robbed. And I was like, how is this happening to you so much, dude? Like he's like, I don't know. I think there's people out to get me. And sometimes that's just the case. There are people who don't like you, people who, who see that you have like a better situation than them. So they look for you. But like, like man, it's, it's just terrible with when it comes to crime. But like, that's the absolute like worst extreme when we're talking about how people are. That's why I'm mentioning it now at the end of all the good things like the good relationships, the relationship I have with crime isn't that bad because I've only been, I've only had two situations where I've run into it and one, I didn't get robbed like on the second one because it was when, I've told this story countless times, but when my brother was getting robbed, I was with my girlfriend at the time and I went back, I saved his butt because I punched the guy, one of the guys that was there and then my brother was able to get away because the other guy let go. But like, it's never been to, to the level where I've just been constantly getting robbed because I always know what to avoid. So yeah, that's the situation with crime. But then let's talk about all the things that my friend said. Like I said right now, I have a friend who just keeps getting robbed. And in general, when I talk to my friends and it comes to conversation topics about work, about how people treat you and like how people are, it's, it's so weird how I have a concept of of like people here being so nice, so positive most of the time. Like obviously everyone has their bad moments, bad days where they just, they're just not the same. But like I've always had really good interactions with people here. And the times that I've had negative ones is when I, I kind of lean back on the things that my friends say. And what my friends say relate very much to the message that was given by the, the other Ecuadorian, like that I mentioned earlier in the first point. And it's basically that Ecuador and Ecuadorians have so much to offer. But what holds back Ecuadorian society is Ecuadorians themselves. Like my friends always say, Ecuadorians have this whole situation with la ley del sabido, which is very similar to viveza criolla. Basically just people who want to take advantage of any and every situation that they can. People are lazy. If they can do a, a, a job like if you imagine a job needs to be completed at 100%, if they can do it at 70, 80%, then they'll do it at 70 or 80% in order to avoid working all 100%. And you could probably say that's just the situation of work smarter, not harder, but I'm not, I'm not referring to working smarter. I'm referring to there's a certain structure to the way you have to do things and people sometimes they don't do it. And this is very blatantly obvious. If you take a look back at the past and I didn't want to bring this up because like it's, it's a terrible situation for Ecuadorians to remember. It's bad for me to remember because I didn't like living through it. But the earthquake, when, when there was a 2016 earthquake here in Puerto Viejo, a lot of people died. Like a lot of buildings were knocked down. Like I think right now it was in Turkey. There's a situation with an earthquake that like there's buildings that have been knocked down and people dying and trapped under like, the breeze, but like here in Ecuador, in Puerto Viejo, we had a similar situation. 
the reason why it, it, it was as bad as it was wasn't because people were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes, some of them were in the wrong place in the wrong time. But buildings here were constructed very poorly. There's a lot of things that, that go into this. First, the people who, who, who asked for the buildings to be made, they underpaid because they, they decided to hire here. A lot of people hire maestros, which are just masters if you translate it, but they're people who, who can do jobs and they charge less for doing these jobs. They do odd jobs pretty much. So they're not, they don't have a degree in architecture or engineering. They just know how to make a house because they understand how to make it. But they don't understand the complexities of making a structurally sound house that can resist earthquakes or that can withstand mother nature. So a lot of the houses, buildings, uh, constructions, businesses that were made here were made with the hand of like, of a maestro, of a master, of these guys who, who aren't, you know, professionals in doing these things. So that's why the houses were knocked down, the buildings were knocked down so easily and why so many people died. And something similar I heard happened in Turkey, where in order to skimp out on prices, like they would use cheap materials. And that happens here too. The fact that people want to like do the job, not like it's supposed to, but to kind of like cut edges, like, you know, to, 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 to save or like save time, save money, like it's just not right. And it's, it's a mentality that people have to underpay, to underwork, to, to just like not do things correctly. And that's considering I'm not even talking about corruption because if we go into corruption, people get jobs because they have a connection in, in a certain place. They have a connection in the government. They have a connection uh, in some kind of like, in some kind of company. And it's like, it's not fair for the people who do study and do work towards getting these jobs that someone just because their family, their friend is in a high position, they can get these jobs. And that's just the, the mentality that my friends always explain to me. Like here we don't get ahead because people are corrupt. They're sabidos. They always think they, they, they can get one on, over on everyone. They're lazy. You tell them to be there at a certain time and they come an hour or two later. People are very unpunctual here. And that's something that I've talked about before. That's why there's a term like the Ecuadorian hour, la hora ecuatoriana, which is a literal representation of how late people arrive in Ecuador to places. Like they had to give it a name. Like, you know, like we're gonna go to a party. Like it, it starts supposedly at eight. No, it doesn't start at eight. Ecuadorian hour, Ecuadorian hour, it starts at 10. So like you can't even trust to arrive at a place on time. Like a lot of people, I don't know, I'm very punctual. I like to be on time. And if someone tells me at eight, I like to be there at 7.45, 7.50. So I don't make anyone wait for me. But here people don't care about that. People will get late because there's just the way people are. But is that really the way people are? And this is where we go into the final point, which is the takeaway points. There's a lot of things that we have to understand here that you could say not everything is set in stone. Like going back to the situation with Salinas, what happened in Salinas, is that a representation of what all Ecuadorians are like? No, I don't believe it is. Because even in the message of the person, this person says the average Ecuadorian. And even if the average were to talk about 50 or 70% of the population, that's not 100% of the population. So are Ecuadorians as bad as the message says? Some of them actually are, and maybe even worse. The thing is, you can't categorize everyone as the same thing. There are some people that have just been blinded by their culture that they believe that doing these bad things is just normal. And even worse than when they get grouped up with a lot of people who are doing the same bad things. Like if you go to a party and everyone's drinking, what are you gonna do? you're probably gonna drink. I don't let myself get forced into this peer pressure. I, don't, I either don't go to parties or when I go, I carry around my water 
But I'm not saying everyone is gonna be like me or is gonna have to be like me or that I'm special in any way. It's just the fact that everyone makes a conscious choice of what they wanna do and a lot of people just decide to get, to make the choice to follow culture, to do the things that everyone else is doing because that's just the norm here. But the fact that it's the norm here does not mean that it should be the norm for everyone or does not mean that it's a good thing. And also, you have to accept, if you're listening to this whole conversation, this whole takeaway, you have to accept that even though the situation might be worse somewhere else, even though a lot of the characteristics, a lot of the things that were mentioned by the message earlier are things that you can say, oh, you see that somewhere else in the world. You have to accept that even though it happens in other places in the world, that does not mean it's okay. It's not the point to compare this situation to a situation somewhere else in the world because we're talking about Ecuador and we're talking about what's happening in Ecuador. We're talking about the reality that people are going through. So if you undermine it by believing that, oh, this place is worse, I've lived in worse places, I've seen worse things, then you're undermining the feelings, like you're, you're undermining everything that they've just talked about, that they've experienced, and it's not fair to them. It's just like saying, oh, you know, whatever. You, you got hurt, not a big deal. And it is a big deal because it does happen. And just because you're in Ecuador doesn't mean that it couldn't happen to you. That's why I always talk about these things. Not to make it seem like it's worse here than anywhere else, but because you need to understand that these things happen here in order to avoid them happening to you. So like a comment that I read once in one of my videos said, Ecuador or Ecuadorians are not magic. Ecuador is an amazing country, but it's not gonna resolve all the dangers of other countries, all the situations that could happen anywhere else, because it could happen here too. And even though we're talking about these things, and even though we made mention of how bad the situation is and the, the negative aspects of Ecuadorian culture, that doesn't mean all Ecuadorians are like this. Going back to the average and going back to the fact that aside from the average, you do have people who are above average, outstanding citizens who literally are on time, who behave well, who don't partake in these things in a negative way. They'll celebrate Carnaval, but they'll celebrate it to themselves. They'll have fun, but in a way that doesn't hurt anyone. There are people who are really good. And like I said earlier, people who commit crimes, there are people who are really bad. So we can't categorize everyone in the same category or every place as dangerous or super safe because you can arrive at a place that is super safe, has the best people, like you can arrive at a place that you heard is the best and somehow you got robbed. It's just the way things are. Not everything is black and white. So you have to understand that there will be shades of gray, that even when things look really good, there are gonna be some things that aren't so good. Like I always say here, even though things are cheaper here, there's still the fact that people are earning much less than other places in the world. So even if you, you look at it like, oh, Ecuador is so cheap, but yeah, it's cheap for people from outside, but for people inside, Ecuador is just as expensive as if they were living in the States because everything you earn, you spend it on food, you spend it on your house, you spend it on the things that you need to live. And as for the situation with the mentality, with the culture of people, we just have to learn to understand, and this is a very important takeaway that I, I want everyone to, to understand, is that people, like, we have to view people as people. And I know that sounds weird because obviously people are people, but think of it this way. If we're viewing this whole situation, if we're thinking about it like, oh, Ecuadorians are like this, then we're failing because you can't just look at Ecuadorian society as a whole and say every Ecuadorian is like this because you can't see every Ecuadorian. You don't understand what every Ecuadorian's been through. You don't really know what every Ecuadorian is like. It's like me going to Japan and saying all Japanese people are the same. It's like me going to the States and saying all people from the States are the same, all Americans are the same. It's like me going to Canada and saying all people, all Canadians are the same. Clearly, in every society, 
in every place that you go to, there are going to be exceptions. There are going to be people who are not the same as everyone else. Even just talking about genders, there's always this really big argument that guys are all the same, girls are all the same, but is every guy and every girl the same? No, of course not. Everyone has different values. Everyone has different situations, different lives that they've lived. Throughout my life, I have not lived seeing people as the place they're from. Like even when I got to Ecuador, like I didn't think of people as just like Ecuadorians. It's just people because people are people. I want you to change the mentality that the place that they're from defines who they are. Because just because an Ecuadorian that you met is perfect doesn't mean that every Ecuadorian is perfect. And vice versa, if someone did you harm in Ecuador, that doesn't mean every Ecuadorian is going to do you harm. And this relates to anything and anyone throughout the world. Anything that is done to you by a person in some place in the world, it's that person's fault. It's not the fault of the whole country. It's not the fault of everyone who is that same race, that same nationality. They're not all the same. Everyone is different. And we need to view people as what they are. Each individual person, not a group of people. And I understand that maybe if you're going to a place, you want to have a general idea of what people are like. But unless you can truly interact with them, the only general idea, someone who can only kind of speak Spanish or can't speak it at all, the only idea they can give you of a person who only speaks Spanish is, oh yeah, they're really nice, they say good morning to me every day, or they, they always uh, lend me a cup of sugar. What more can you say if you can't talk to this person? On the other hand, if you live through everything, then of course you're going to get to know what they truly are, and then you can say, oh, these people are like this. But yeah, that's the main takeaway that I want you to get from this whole episode is the fact that try to treat people as people. Try to not let the idea that you know someone from a specific culture or specific environment influence your thoughts on everyone else because everyone is different. And also remember that every place is different as well. So even if you think that you know what a certain place is like, like a certain city in a certain country, that doesn't mean every city in the country is going to be the same. So basically all this to say that you should always keep a neutral standpoint when you're getting to know people and don't let yourself be influenced by what one person or two people showed you. And as a final thought, I want you to take into consideration the fact that if there's something that you want to see in a certain culture or maybe a change that you want made, changes and stuff like that are very complicated when it comes to culture because you can't go into a culture and change people. I don't want anyone to believe that and I don't want anyone to believe that they're better than anyone else or that I think that I'm better than anyone else or that anyone is better than anyone else. But if there's something positive that you see a culture can improve with, then the best way for, for that change to be made is for you to lead by example. When people see that something works for you, there's a good chance that they'll also want to implement it in their lives. And if they do, little by little, even if it's just on a community basis, you'll see how things start to change. And thus, you can make a positive change in your environment. So it doesn't necessarily even have to be in Ecuador. Wherever you're at, if there's a problem you have with the situation around you, if you feel like things could be better, then the first step starts with you. And that's everything we have to talk about in regards to Selena's, the message, the takeaways. I hope it helped. I hope it taught you something new that maybe you learned something that you didn't really expect to know about Ecuadorian culture. We'll be back at a later date, maybe with more episodes going more in depth with certain situations that we talked about today or other things that you might not know about Ecuador. So make sure to stay tuned, make sure to take care, and as always, ace out.